Hello, everybody, and welcome to our HP webinar, New HPC Storage for the New HPC Era. My name is Uli Plechschmidt, and I'm responsible for worldwide product marketing for HPC Storage. With me on the call today is Dr. Torben Kling Peterson, principal engineer and the original cluster store architect who launched the first cluster store system at ISC 2011 in Hamburg. So, even so, we both have worldwide roles. We both are based in the European time zone. Torben is in Gothenburg in Sweden, and I'm I'm in Munich. By the way, if you hear a little background noise, you know that's why that, that's because I had an internet outage this morning um, in the whole district, and I'm sitting in a in a McDonald's um, in the next district. So, Torben is also going to to drive the slides. Hey, Torben, how are you today? I'm All good. good in Gothenburg. Good in awesome. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for your yes, assistance. <laughs> So we're going to tag team today. Um, while I'm doing the presentation for the first like 30, 35 minutes or so, Torben will answer then the questions that you are putting in the chat window during the presentation. And then we have another 10 minutes or so scheduled to, to, to answer the questions um, together. So um, if we go to slide two, um, you see um, a key quote from Rick Stevens um, from Argon National Laboratory. And that's really the theme of the of the call of today, um, that the the confluence of AI with tradi traditional simulations running on the same HPC cluster or the same supercomputer um, is really changing everything. I mean, he's talking more about you know how it's changing science and accelerating science, but it also changes um, the underlying storage architecture. And storage architectures that we that were serving us well for the last years, you know, kind of need to be rethought. And we did this. We saw this coming about two years ago when we started to develop a new storage system, the Cray Cluster Story 1000 system, for this new area era where you have um, modeling and simulation with method running together with methods of AI like machine learning, deep learning, um, on the same cluster. Um, that is, that consists of CPU nodes, but also GPU um, accelerated nodes. So if we go to the next slide, slide three, um, the key thing to understand is that, that this convergence is happening right now. So the convergence of AI and modeling and simulation um, is not something which we think might happen um, in a few years from now. It's actually happening right now. And what you see on slide three here is um, the results of a of a survey in a stack 360, um, which is uh, an analyst, uh, independent analyst company specifically focused on uh, the high performance computing market, um, um, did where they asked um, their subscriber base, um, and I think it was about 860 organizations that are using HPC technologies to either achieve their mission or achieve um, their their business objectives. Um, they were asking them, how many of you are already running um, machine learning as parts of your workflow together with, uh, with um, modeling and simulation on your clusters or supercomputers? And as you can see, you know, the majority answered, you know, 61% answered they're already doing it today, and an additional 10% um, plan to do so in the next 12 months. And that survey is from October 2019, so when the new one comes out, um, then probably it will be in the 70-75% range. So on slide four, uh, we just see a very high-level simplified picture of um, you know, why that is a challenge for traditional storage architectures and systems. Because the input-output profiles of machine learning uh, the classic, uh, so machine learning and, and classic modeling and simulation could and if you look at traditional simulations, you know, traditionally, I think, you know, um, you had like a lot of data typically measured in petabytes, um, um, very often large files that were written in sequential order um, at pretty much extreme speed. So if, if we're looking at this, you know, sequential order, large files, streaming IO, pointing or so in modeling and in modeling and simulation, and then it's Storage systems, parallel storage systems with hard disk drives, you know, only, you know, they really like large streaming IOs. You know, that's great. So, but then you have machine learning 
training phase of machine learning, when you're training models, um, it's mainly reading. So, I mean, the, 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 the um, right read pattern is like 90% read. And, you know, unfortunately, often it's also files of all sizes, also a lot of small files, you know, which are read um, very often in random order. Um, and, and this is where you typically had, like, you know, people were using enterprise all flash NAS systems, like a pure storage flash blade or, you know, a NetApp AFF ar arrays or so, together with their, you know, couple of Apollo 6500 or NVIDIA DGXs, you know, in a rack to train the models. So if you want to do that now on one machine um, on slide five, you know, if we go to slide five, you see a little comparison how the IO profiles really could not be more different. So on slide five, what you see in slide five is basically a table that you see also on the HPC storage um, page of Hewlett Packard Enterprise on, um, on the web. And it, the, the challenge here is really not just the different write and read patterns and one is more sequential and machine learning is more random and so on, but it's also, you know, the, the size of the, of the um, how storage capacity is measured. If you look on the left side, traditionally, you know, if you're doing um, high performance computing, um, you, you're measuring your capacity in the parallel file systems in petabytes. Now, it might be one, two, three, you know, or five or 10 or whatever. Um, but if you're looking on the right side, the traditional, you know, AI pod, you know, whether it's an NVIDIA DGX pod or HP Apollo 6500s and so on, you typically measure the capacity in terabytes, you know, hundreds of terabytes, 100, 200, and so on. And and if you're on the right side in, in the, you know, 100, 200 terabyte um, um, capacity ranges, um, that's actually an area where, um, you know, pure storage flash blade and NetApp and Dell, EMC, um, Isilon, you know, now called power, power scale, is actually affordable. But if you bring all of that together and now you need a storage system, a shared external storage system that can serve, you know, petabytes of data um, um, it, it, for both workloads, that's really a challenge. It's a commercial challenge. It's not just an architectural challenge. <laughs> it's also an economic challenge. So if we go to slide six, um, what we see on slide six is the, the latest forecast from Hyperion Research, the other independent analyst company exclusively focused on the high performance computing market, um, where they're basically forecasting that for the next years throughout 2024, um, HPC storage spending will grow 40% faster every year than HPC server spending. And what we shared now in the introduction is basically the main driver you know, for that. And, and we think that is bad. <laughs> so we think that is bad. You know, storage only companies like, like you know, Network Appliance or you know, DDN and so on, they think it's great. But we think it's bad because at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, we really think about, you know, balanced systems. And very often, you know, the budget that customers have for the next generation system, whether it's a supercomputer or an HPC cluster, is fixed. You know, so we think it's bad that storage eats more and more of the fixed budget at the expense of the CPU or the GPU accelerated nodes. You know, this is why, you know, so two years ago, we really thought about how can we architect a system, you know, that can deal with the with the with the merged workloads of the on the of the new era, and serve all of the of the I/O well, but do this in a very very efficient way. So if we go to slide seven, um, that picture, this arrow, this merging arrow, basically just you know at a glance shows what the challenge is. You know, you had like in the past traditional parallel um, um, file st um, storage systems with which were mainly HDD based, you know, a Cray cluster to L300, for example, or a DDN exascaler or an IBM Elastic Storage Server. Very cost effective, you know, if you compare them with enterprise storage from a price per terabyte perspective and very, very scalable, but not really well suited to serve the mixed random I.O. That, that machine learning, deep learning applications need that are now running on the same machine too. 
And on the bottom, you have the traditional all flash enterprise um, file storage, you know, pure storage flash blades, NetApp AFF, Dell EMC Powers, PowerEdge, you know, kind of a, a Cumulon HP servers, you know, which are really well suited to serve the mixed random IO of machine learning and AI. But they have an order of magnitude higher cost per terabyte because it's enterprise, it's kind of enterprise um, all flash storage. So new, new HPC storage is needed and this is why we developed um, on slide eight, if we go to the next slide, the Cray cluster store E1000. And, and, and we have designed this system um, to, to be as cost effective as scalable as you know, um, classic parallel file system, um, um, solutions for high performance computing, but at the same time as well suited to serve mixed and random IO than um, the traditional all flash enterprise um, storage systems you typically have deployed in, a, in an AI pod. So on slide nine, um, it's just a, a high level, a high level slide which shows you um, that the Cray Cluster Store E1000 is available um, since an HP product since August 3rd, um, 2020. And we're also super happy to share with you that just two months after launch, um, yeah, two months and two days after launch, <laughs> actually, we already achieved um, the two exabyte um, milestone, which means, you know, we now already have shipped or have in signed backlog two exabyte um, of capacity for the Cray cluster, so E1000, and we're really happy about that, because you know, if you look at if you look at innovation, <laughs> innovation is always invention and adoption. So I mean, we invented a great product, um, but if it doesn't get adopted, you know, it really doesn't benefit anybody. So we're really happy with the adoption of the Cray cluster, so E1000 system. And we think it's the, the unique combination of the five bullet points you, you see on slide nine. It's really architected to drive unprecedented performance. And we're going to talk to, about that a little bit later, but you can get up to 80 gigabytes per second from just your know, read performance from just 24 SSDs. And, and, th and that translates, you know, if you divide 80 gigabytes by 24, that translates to 3.3 gigabyte per second per SSD. And that's about the efficiency. If you're designing storage systems for HPC, it's really about making sure, you know, that you're getting the maximum performance from each and every drive through the parallel file system to the compute nodes. So this is file system performance. That's not block performance, you know, it's file system performance. And, and that's really unheard of, um, unheard of efficiency. And it's it, the efficiency, the performance efficiency is, is really a key criteria um, for us because it doesn't matter at what storage system you look. You now, more than 60% of the cost of the bill of materials of any storage system resides in the drives. Whether it's SSDs or HDDs, it doesn't matter. So if you wanna build you know, very efficient HPC storage systems, you need to make sure you architect it in, in, with the, this criteria in mind. How can we exploit the inherent your performance in the drives and expose the maximum possible to the compute nodes. So that's a key thing. Then also from a connectivity perspective, um, we're supporting um, InfiniBand, EDR, HDR, and 100, 200 gigabit ethernet, as well as the new interconnect for the Exascale era, the 200 gigabit per second HP slingshot. It's probably also worth mentioning that the performance numbers we, we show you um, um, here on this slide and on following slides um, are really assuming that you are using fast interconnects. And fast means 200 gigabit per second interconnects. So either InfiniBand HDR or 200 gigabit Ethernet or HP slingshot. And the reason for that is while if, of course, you know, the system works with 100 gigabit connections, you know, if you, if you use 100 gigabit um, per second interconnect, it's so fast that you know, if you're not using 200 gigabit per second, you have ex actually have stranded capacity and perf uh, stranded performance in the system um, because you're network bound. Um, so that's important to, to also consider. And then you know the benefits of an open source Lustre files of the open source Lustre file system, um, but with enterprise grade support from HPE's own 
cluster development team. That's really important. You know, if you if you look at the history of Luster, um, so <laughs> Luster was the first the first version 1.0 was released in December 2003. Over the history of of uh, the open source parallel file system movement Luster, um, there basically were two organizations that were were commer you know, commercial organizations that were contributing a lot to the community. Uh, in addition to you know the customers that are con con um, co um, contributing to the to the community. So and one was WAM Cloud um, that was acquired 2010 by Intel and then 2018 by DDN. And the other one was Cluster Store, the Cluster Store team, the original Cluster Store team that was acquired in the year 2010 by Xyratex, that then was acquired in the year 2014 by Seagate, in the year 2017 by Cray, and now has found its, its, its permanent home in Hewlett Packard Enterprise. It's really important to understand that what we can give customers is basically the benefits of an open source file system, which is you know no li software licenses for per terabyte or per drive, no risk of software audits, and all of those good things about open source. Um, but at the same time, we also can provide enterprise grade support for the file system, um, and that is, I think, a pretty interesting combination, which most likely also has contributed to the to the strong and fast adoption. So if we go to slide 10, um, one thing I wanted to share with you is, a, is an interesting report also from Hyperion Research from June um, this year. And I put the link in the, in the presentation. And by the way, you get the presentation um, slides. You can download the presentation slides um, at, uh, versus the end of the, of the webinar. And if you want to read this, um, this report, which talks about the shifts that are occurring in the file system landscape, um, where Hyperion Research did multi-client studies in the year 2015, 17, and 19, tracking basically the usage of different file systems in HPC. And um, as you can see, NFS, you know, is still kind of, especially in, for workgroup and departmental clusters, HP clusters, you know, still like, you know, um, the, the most widely used file system. But once you get into larger clusters, and let's let's say you know hundreds of nodes and, and more, um, you need parallel file systems, and the market is uh, the parallel file system market is pretty much split you know nearly 50/50 between Luster and IBM Spectrum Scale. Um, so and as you can see here, what what um, Hyperion Research basically reported. Um, is that Lustre is the parallel file system that has been consistently growing um, over the last years and also now, um, by now, is the most widely used parallel file system um, in HPC. And that's a true statement for commercial and scientific use cases, um, which is, I think, a great thing for the open source, the vibrant open source community of Lustre. So if we go to the next slide on slide 11, um, and, and Torben, just probably do, you know, kind of just click it through, you know, while I talk to it. It's a couple of, uh, a couple of build slides. So the way you build a cluster source system is um, at, the, at the top of the rack, you typically have two one gigabit um, Aruba switches, and that's just the private net management network for the system. And then you basically can add um, um, all uh, a system management unit. It's a 2U, a 2U unit which runs the system management functions for the storage system. And then you add at least one metadata unit and typically one metadata unit is enough um, to drive the metadata, the metadata functions for the parallel file system. You can um, also scale metadata performance out by adding more of those metadata units, but typically one is enough. And then you start adding all flash scalable storage units. You now it's 2U24 um, form factor, 24 NVMe Gen 4 um, SSDs, and which drive up to 80 gigabits per second read um, out of those 24 SSDs and up to 50 gigabyte per second write out of those um, you know, 24 SSDs. And then you just can add and add and add scalable storage um, 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 units, all flash scalable storage units, until you drive most of your performance, your required performance from flash. 
and then you know if you click if you click it out further um torben you basically see your adding can also add um hard disk drive based scalable storage units for capacity um and 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 why are you doing that why are you not just filling the whole rack up with flash you know the reason for that is that today there's about a 10x you know a factor of 10 price difference between flash and and hard disk drives yeah you know? and IDC predicts in their in their in their uh, storage media forecast that even in the year 2024, it probably will be a difference between six to eight x, uh, a factor of six to eight difference in price per terabyte between nearline hard disk drives, 7.2 k RPM hard disk drives, and flash. So and, and that is the, that is the reason why you know we're providing you know the the capability um, to basically drive performance from flash, and then also in the same file system it add um, hard disk drive based scalable storage units for a hot um, a disk drive pool to basically provide the cost effective capacity. So if we go to slide 12, you see exactly what I just talked. Um, on a high level um, about where you know you have you have we have customers about half of the Cray, Cray cluster store E1000 systems are shipping as as hard disk drive systems on the left side. It's important to understand that even on the left side, the metadata is always on very fast PCI Gen 4 flash. We're talking here about basically the user data, you know, in luster terms, object storage targets. And they are in, on the left side here, where if you build an all HDD file system, they're on hard disk drives. And the reason why still 50%, you know, on, on um, are of this, um, the systems shipped are on the left side is that there are still customers out there who are just driving classic modeling and simulation on their clusters. And they have pretty much, you know, the majority is, is large sequential streaming I.O., you know, mainly write, you know. So for them, there's no need to actually, you know, basically deploy fast flash outside of the metadata infrastructure. For them, that works really great. And then we also have on the right side, on slide 12, we also have people and customers who are building all flash file systems. So um, the probably the most exciting one is the one that NERSC is building for the Pearl Mother um, system, which is a, a 35 petabyte usable capacity all flash file system based on on the Cray cluster store E1000 um, all flash scalable storage units with you know about five terabyte ter terabyte per second performance. And then in the middle, you know, this is about 20%. 20% of the systems we're shipping are all flash file systems. And then about 30% are in the middle where you have the tiered file system where you have a flash pool and a disk pool in, inside the same file system. And you're, you're using um, Cray Cluster Store data services software um, to basically drive performance from, from flash and drive capacity. Um, from disk and then have the software that helps you basically for data movement and, and automation and so on with great clusters or data services. So on slide 13, just wanted, wanted to show you a few um, installations um, and implementations for Cray Cluster Store E1000 in Europe because this um, webinar is targeted at EMEA. Um, later, we're going to also talk about a couple of US-based systems. And you know, recently, just this week, we announced that um, the new um, um, national supercomputer for Australia, the PAUSI supercomputer, will also use Cray Cluster Store E1000, as well as the, uh, the square kilometer array in Australia. So it's basically going well around the world. But as we're in, in Europe, just a couple of a um, couple of European um, examples. So on um, on slide 13, on the left side, you see um, the supercomputing center in in Switzerland in Lugano, um, which gets Cray Cluster Story 1000 for the Phase One upgrade of the bit stained machine. Then on the right side, you have CNES, um, the French National Computing Center for Higher Education, where um, we're deploying a 30 petabyte um, Cray Cluster Story 1000 system on page 14 um, to go to the UK. 
Um, uh, Craig Cluster Store E1000 is also the parallel file system for the new national supercomputer of the United Kingdom. So the Archer 2 system. So there you see just a couple of the compute racks, HPE um, Cray EX attached with HPE Slingshot to Cray Cluster Store um, E1000. That's a tiered file system. And then you know in the Edinburgh um, Parallel Computing Center, um, the Edinburgh International Data Facility. Um, with also a tiered file system with half a petabyte all flash and 25 petabyte um, of hard disk drives. This is just to show you a couple of practical examples where in Europe Cray Cluster Story 1000 is under implementation um, at the moment. So on slide 15, um, on the next slide, um, we have a couple of the larger um, US-based systems and you can see on your own, you know, kind of that they are pretty interesting um, capacity points. So who would have thought a couple of years ago um, that at the top we would build you know, a 700 petabyte usable file system, one file system that can drive 10 terabyte per second. Now that's really, really, um, really, really um, exciting, we think. And then the Argon system, for example, at the bottom, you know, this is like a classic hard disk drive based, um, based systems with 200 petabyte usable capacity and two file systems, aggregate 1.6 terabyte per second performance um, that we actually um, have already shipped and also got acceptance for. But the, the message of this slide actually is when we architected the Cray Cluster Story 1000 system, you know, we did not just architect it for those huge exascale and pre-exascale national lab type um, of, of use cases. We really said we need to allow customers to start anywhere, if necessary, also small, to then be able to scale out in the same architecture without any architectural limitations to and even beyond if they wanted to, you know, the systems you see on the top of the slide. And we're showing you here, you know, how, where you, how you can start, you know, so it's basically 16 rec units for, um, for HDD based um, 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 scalable storage units and, and it's, it's eight rec units if you want to start with all flash. And then you can buy, can combine and mix and match um, both with Cray Cluster Store Data Services. So on slide 16, um, this is just, you know, at a glance comparison with um, other, you know, popular storage alternatives um, where we're really proud about the fact that we're driving really unprecedented read and write performance um, and efficiency um, from, from, the, from the drives. Um, then we also have our own so software to protect and manage um, the permanent data or migrate migrate between different file systems. So we don't, don't have time today to go into the HP data management framework, but that's our solution um, to, to for you know, hierarchical um, storage management, for archive, for data protection, backup, um, and data migration between, um, between different file systems. So we talked about Cray Cluster Store Data Services. That's for data movement within within the Luster file system. But if you wanted to move um, data from a Luster file system to an IBM Spectrum Scale file system, or you know up and down the storage hierarchy between file systems, you know to a tape library, to a HDD based object store, to cloud storage with S3, that is where HP Data Management Framework comes in. And then the benefits of the being an open source, an open source file system, not charging any, any um, you know, software license fees per drive or per, per terabyte capacity. Um, we also ship, you know, Cray Cluster Story 1000 always as an integrated, engineered, soak tested system out of our um, factory in Chippewa Falls. So unlike others who probably ship more in piece parts and then assemble it, you know, kind of on site. Um, and then for customers, you know, who are using HPE compute today, and HPE, according to Hyperion Research and the other analysts, is the number one HPC computing vendor in the industry. Um, so um, for customers who are already using HPE compute, HPC compute from HPE, like for example, HP Apollo servers or HP ProLion clusters with InfiniBand adapters and so on, um, for them, actually, it's a big benefit 
that they now can have the same support provider for the full stack, not just for compute, but also um, for storage, because the Cray Cluster Story 1000 is an HP product since August, which means that it also gets supported um, by HP Point Next um, in 140 countries around around the planet. And then, then the last point here is for some customers, um, especially commercial customers, you know, they are thinking about how can we better align our, our expenditures with the business. And this is where HP GreenLake comes in. You know, where you really said instead of instead of purchasing or leasing, uh, which were the, the classic sourcing options um, for the HPC infrastructure, I would like to have metered consumption. You know, basically the cloud that comes to me, you know, cloud-like, but it's still uh, um, the cloud that comes to me in my data center or into a co-location facility um, near me. So slide 17. Um, just gives you a little bit of an overview for the markets we have architected the Cray Cluster Story 1000 as the new um, HPC storage for the new era of converged workloads, machine learning and AI. And, and if you look at the market generally in, in high performance computing, there are like two types of customers, two types of buyers. So they're the buyers who say, I want a supercomputer. Um, and those are mainly government funded organizations like you know national labs or you know weather forecasting sites you know climate research centers you know and so on who really say i want a supercomputer i want i want you know i i know i don't have the choice about my linux operating system or the inner connect and so on but it's it's a fully engineered end to end system that pushes performance beyond the limits which is possible today and on the left, you see basically the technology stack we, we have for this type of buyer segment. And on the right, you then see, you know, kind of the an end -to -end, the, the HP end-to-end -end solution for customers who say, I want, I, I want standard rack service. Standard rack service that fit into standard racks, you know, where I can choose my Linux operating system and I can choose my inner connect and, and, and so on. And, you know, with the acquisition of Cray, Hewlett Packard Enterprise can now offer end-to-end -end, um, intellectual property across the full stack, including end-to-end -end support for the full stack, um, which I think is really important if you have really challenging hard problems. <laughs> so if you're running one, if you're running kind of an HPC infrastructure, and then your users call and say. Hey, I'm running every day a mission critical um, job um, where I have a hard deadline, and every day it runs like for 17 minutes, and and since two days it runs like you know 10 hours, and I'm 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 missing my SLAs and my critical deadlines. That's a that's a tough problem, you know. If you have like vendor A on the software layer, vendor B on the compute layer, vendor C on the storage layer. Um, so some some customers say I want a, a, a one hand to shake or one throat to choke <laughs> in case I have critical end-to-end -end issues that are spanning the full stack. Um, on slide 18, you just see um, um, a blog that we recently published that compares the efficiency, you know, um, per storage drive or per CPU that you can get out of the Cray clusters to E1000 with other um, uh, with other alternatives you have in the market. And on slide 19, I just want to give you a little glimpse you now, and this is not like a tech talk where we go really deep into, into the technology. So if you're interested to get a deep dive briefing, um, as a as a follow up for the for that webinar, we're more than happy, you know, to do that for you, where we go really deep in the technology. But this is just an, at a glance view, you know, how we have architected the storage controller um, for the for the Cray Cluster Story 1000, and it's a it's an end to end zero bottleneck PCI Gen 4 design, and it's a very balanced design. Um, with which which has like zero bottlenecks, but also zero stranded quality or, or or performance. And if you look at the server module, you know the server modules. It's an HA design where you have 
two 1P ser embedded server modules. You see that they have 48 PCIe 4.0 lanes to the network and 48 PCIe um, Gen 4 lanes to the 24 SSDs. So each SSD has two lanes to each of the CPUs and that's a very balanced design. And, and then you take the performance of, of modern NVMe Gen 4, um, and PCIe Gen 4 um, SSDs, and, and this is how we get like 3.3 .3 gigabyte per second um, file system performance, read performance through the, through the parallel file system up to the, um, up to the nodes. Um, on slide 20, there are, I think, three clicks, um, um, Torben, as you're driving the slide. Um, one of the key things was not just to basically architect an extremely fast storage system, but we wanted to architect uh, an extremely efficient storage system too. And if you remember at the beginning of the slide, the forecast that you know HPC storage is forecasted to grow 40% faster than HPC server spending for the next four years. Um, if you look at traditional storage architectures, that basically means you know that if you're if you're staying on your traditional storage architectures, um, most likely storage will eat more and more of your of your system budget, and we don't think that's a good idea. This is why we architect the Cray Cluster Story 1000 with the goal to put you on a new curve, so you continue can continue to build balanced systems, end-to-end -end systems, and storage doesn't eat more and more um, of the budget ex at the expense of CPU and GPU compute nodes. Um, slide 20, this is just a summary, you know, what the typical challenges are with legacy storage. Most customers we talk to um, complain about but if they have legacy older infra storage infrastructures, that their I.O. bottlenecks and their expensive CPU and GPU nodes often are idle, sitting idle, waiting for the I.O., which is really very inefficient. Um, that storage eats more and more of the overall budget at the expense of compute. And also then sometimes that there are, sometimes there are situations where there are frustrating vendor finger pointing situations in end-to-end -end, um, issues where you have a vendor A on the software layer, vendor B on the compute layer, and vendor C on the, on the storage layer. Um, and the next slide just shows, you know, what, um, why we designed the Cray Cluster Story 1000 in order to make that desired state of the, fu um, desired state of the future um, a reality. And uh, that already brings me to the last slide. Um, to stay in the 40-minute window for the presentation. Um, if you want to learn more, we invite you to either read the business white paper for the Cray Cluster SOE 1000 or read the technical white paper that's linked um, on slide 23. Um, or if, you're, if you want to even know more, you know, to request a briefing via your um, HP account manager. And by the way, if you don't um, know who your HP account manager is, <laughs> because today you're using um, HPC infrastructure from other HPC vendors um, um, on the on the last slide here um, on the thank you slide. I also put my my email address in. Um, so in case you don't know who your HP account manager is, um, just ping me um, under that under that email address, and then I can um, I can basically get you in touch with um, the right HP colleague. And that um, brings the presentation for today um, that was scheduled for 40 minutes and I'm happy that I stayed um, on time to an end. And now, you know, we would like to spend, um, you know, the, the next 10 minutes or so to answer questions that came in during, um, in the chat window um, during the presentation. So Torben, did any, did you have any questions coming in that we can answer yes. now together? Yes, definitely. Uh, I, I actually got a very good one to start you off with here. And uh, one of our listeners asked the question, how do we actually compare an E1000 Lustre solution with a BGFS solution? Okay, yeah. Do you want to take this or should I Should I take this? Yeah, you go ahead. Our, uh, okay, okay. So, yeah, BGFS. Um, is an interesting uh, parallel file system, you know, um, supported by by ThinkPark in Germany, um, originally owned by the Fraunhofer Society. Um, 
the big difference if we compare both of them um, is really adoption. Um, so BGFS um, is has not really seen adoption outside of um, I would say the German academia sector in some universities and some accounts worldwide. Um, and if you look at Luster, Luster about you know two thirds of the top 100 um, supercomputers um, use Luster. The other one third uses IBM Spectrum Scale. Um, so I think if we if you compare it. Um, the the biggest the biggest you know um, I would say benefit for me for Luster, which also is an open source system, um, is really the adoption and that it's a really proven um, proven um, open source um, parallel file system, and that also you can get enterprise grade support for it. So if you look at ThinkPark, you know, and I know ThinkPark, you know, so <laughs> it, it's a very very small support team. Um, and a very, very small development team. And there's not really a vibrant community, you know, around it um, um, like you have in, uh, with Luster, where a lot of the, you know, U.S. national labs and so on are really contributing heavily together with, you know, the HPE cluster store team, WAM Cloud and others. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's for me the, the biggest differentiation. Um, and and BGFS is around since a long time too. And at the end, I think you probably wanna wanna deploy a system that also has really you know, a big, vibrant community and a lot of adoption. Um, so that would be my answer, yeah, Torben. And I think there's probably a lot of te technological things we could discuss about it. Um, but for me, that's that's really the the, the biggest differentiation. Yeah, and, and I, I definitely agree with that. I, I would also say that, that even though BGFS is very good at certain specific workloads, certain specific types of uh, requirements, such as extreme metadata performance, there is also a lot of questions from you know customers that have used both on how to improve things like the HA community and um, and and so on and so forth. Uh, to to improve it, and we haven't seen much of that mainly because the, as you say, the development team and the development resources are not that many people around. And in, in on top of that, a lot of the original developers have gone on to become, I would call it, uh, working for more commercial companies like Amazon and so on and so forth. So they are no longer really engaged with this solution. So I, I think yeah, and, and yeah. I, I agree with you, Torben. And then I think you know, there was there was really some momentum, mainly marketing, not so much adoption around BGFS. Probably one and a half years ago, you know, two years ago, and then Sven Breuner, the CTO, basically you know left, um, taking with him a few of the key developers going to Accelero, which is like an NVMe over Fabric startup, and so the the basically the the, the the partner community also said that since then it's not it's not the same anymore. <laughs> Let's put it this way. But we're looking actually from time to time at, at alternative um, file systems, which we also could put on the E1000 hardware platform. Um, and we're definitely also looking at BGFS. And like Torben said, it has a couple of really good advantages, but it also has a couple of disadvantages that has prevented it to really be deployed at scale. You know, to be be to show up with ten implementations or so in the top one hundred list, um, and I think that's probably enough huh, for for that. Uh, so I hope we we answer that question <laughs> in depth. Yeah. So the second question we have is comparing Luster with Mapr. I don't want if I should take that one. Yeah. Um, sure. Go ahead. And so so. Uh, MapR and Luster does have some similarities. It, it's modular. It can scale to exabytes uh, sizes. It has the concept of being distributed and so on and so forth. Uh, so definitely a lot of similarities. But the differences here is MapR was originally created as an Hadoop type file system with replication of data between different nodes to provide parallel bandwidth by multiple copies and so on and so forth. Luster was always uh, developed for ultra performance. 
It, it uses RDMA for any and all transaction. It uses flash uh, acceleration what it can do and it's now optimized for it. It is being uh, extremely pushed uh, as a file system and developed as a file system for not just uh, HPC, but also the AI wor workflows. Now, MapR, with all its, its value, uh, is more being, uh, since we acquired it at HP, um, we are focusing more as a an object store, kind of a data lake type tool that can supply a, 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 a um, storage space in the hundreds of petabytes uh, solution um, as a fairly cheap and flexible backend. It does support NFS natively and other similar type of, of uh, platforms which Luster uh, rarely do uh, unless we add an additional functions to it. So it, it's two different solutions that have similarities, but I would say MapR is more for the for the uh, big data type solution, whereas Luster is for AI and for um, uh, for uh, HPC. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, I, I totally agree with you, Torben. And, and I mean, if we look at really, today we're talking about parallel file system or file systems, let's say for high performance computing, high performance computing running, you know, modeling and simulation, machine learning, blah, blah, and so on. But it's as for the high performance computing market. And as you said, um, MapR is a distributed file system. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really great for yeah, this data lake analytics you mentioned. So especially if you see now where the use cases are and you think edge to core, you know, you're, where you need a file system for the core, in, the, in your core data center um, for analytics, and then you also need a file system that is, that is able for the, to, to perform at the edge, you know, for the analytics and the aggregation you're doing in edge devices. Um, that is, you know, where Luster doesn't fit at all, you know. So, um, and HPE now calls um, the former MapR um, the HP Esmeral data fabric. And that's exactly the use case for it, you know, where you have edge to core, basically data infrastructures, um, mainly for, for, for analytics. And this is, I think, where, where MapR and now HP data, Esmeral data fabric really shines. You know, and where also Lustre would be totally useless, you know, if you wanted to do analytics and aggregation at the edge. I hope that, that makes a, sense. Yeah. So we, we got actually a follow-up question that pertains to exactly that, and I think you already answered with a question saying, will Lustre become part of the Esmeral platform? Uh, and I think you already answered that question. Yeah, and, and I think, yeah, it's, it's, so it's highly unlikely. You know, because if you think about the Esmeral, um, um, HP Esmeral platform with the HPC, uh, the HP Esmeral container, um, container platform and the data fabric and so on. So this is really all about, you know, the edge to core as a service. It's not, um, and, and Luster, you know, and other file systems, you know, are really focused, you know, there at the, at the high performance computing space. So I, I don't own branding for Hewlett Packard Enterprise, but I think from a use case perspective, you know, um, it wouldn't make a lot of sense to make Luster and the cluster, great cluster store E1000 and so on a part of the the Esmeral platform. It's a different, it's a it's a much broader, you know, um, brand than than high performance computing. Right. So I think the next question is probably for me. It uh, states that Luster used to be a very fragile file system that needed a lot of rebuilding. How often does it crash nowadays? Well, the, the short answer is it never crashes, but that would be a, a, a lie with a modification. I would say that um, Luster today is extremely stable. We are running it in some of the most demanding uh, file, send, uh, file systems in the world, like the different weather services around the world, like ECMWF, uh, uh, Meteo Swiss, uh, um, Danish Weather Service, the, all the, the US Weather Services, the Australian Weather Service, uh, Bureau of Meteorology, and so on and so forth. Um, and in most cases, we have issues with the file system uh, on a perhaps once every two or three months. It is not something that happens on a daily basis anymore. That, that's the that's thing in the past. And we spent a lot of time uh, making sure that these things 
uh, shouldn't happen, both with the HA features we have and also with some of the uh, file system checks that can now run in parallel on active file system. So I, I would say that the the fragility of a lost file system that uh, I, I acknowledge we had once upon a time is definitely no longer a case. Um, so it's it's much more stable today. Uh, now uh, I know we're kind of run out of time, but I think the next question is also interesting, which is um, even if uh, Lustre is uh, basically out of the HPC area, um, does it support DNFS for customers uh, using uh, DP over, N uh, over NFS to simplify uh, automation of unmounting, cloning, mounting file system, and so on and so forth with physical and, uh, and uh, virtual machine servers? Well, uh, we are looking for DF DNFS support on the system because it does, as you have some very typically uh, enterprise type requirements. But that kind of flexibility is also a challenge when it comes to maintaining a, a, a namespace where the performance is key, not the flexibility necessarily. So that whole concept of unmounting, cloning, and so on and so forth is really not something we're looking at doing in a Lustre file system. That is more for other types of file systems to do. We can do part of it. We can do some uh, details, and, but it is not uh, the, the main challenge. Specifically, if your clients are running on virtual machine servers, that is usually a, a an area we stay away from because that means you're limited essentially to what the hypervisor can do, i.e. NFS in this case. And NFS is not uh, suited for parallel file systems even though we do support a NFS gateway to a file system. So uh, support for the NFS is un un ongoing and we're looking at how to do that for some of those customers who need that extra functionality. But for the most part, I would not expect to see this widely deployed in Lustre file systems in the near future. All right, Arm, I think we're running out of time, huh? So yes, any definitely. any other key questions still um, out there that we should answer, you know, even running a little bit over over the 50 minutes that were scheduled? Not on the questions that are coming so far, so I think we're good. Okay. Um, yeah, no, then I, I, I think I, I want to thank everybody for the participation in today's um, HP webinar. Uh, we hope that it was time well spent for you. And as I said, if you if you heard anything that is of a particular interest um, um, and you would like to get a, a dedicated um, um, briefing you know, over um, WebEx or Skype or so, you know, we're more than happy um, to do that. We're both in the European time zone, as we said, and um, yeah, with that, you know, that ends today's webinar. So have a great rest of the day and uh, most importantly, stay safe. Thank you very much. And thank you, Torben, um, also for participating.